this is almost a self-funding working group anyway. <laughs> Only, only the two chairs have certain magic powers. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what those magic powers are. Or to declare consensus. Oh, is that what it is? Pretty much. I declare consensus that uh, I don't know. Okay. Well, that's not a very useful thing. It's the most mm -hmm. useful. Oh, here's There's power. Wow, that's really impressive to be a double jabber strike. I mean, that's like double. Sure. <laughs> Redundant. Babble and jabber are the same thing. Oh, thanks. Julius is in here, so we can't start. I'm not too sure about that. Yeah. We can do something exciting like introduce ourselves. That's okay, we can see it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to see it. Just turn the monitor around. Maybe. I'm <laughs> not sure. Well, this, this seems actually unusual that there's no remote people. Oh, yes, there are. Sorry. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are people. Yeah. It's hard to see from here. No, there's, a, there's a constant conversation about trains on the uh, chapter. Okay. And about Julius uh, turning the lovely. Why don't Julius turn the lovely? Can you tell me? Please tell me. I mean. Yeah, I'd be a little silly. <laughs> Well, I might do that. I might do that if I was going to present something that people might throw rotten tomatoes at me for. I mean, I found the meeting where there was like a big head table and people around the table. Some of them joined the meeting remotely so they could have it on the screen right in front of them. The way down there. <laughs> you know. Julius, we heard you were you were joining remotely from your hotel room. <laughs> no, I'm actually joining remotely from down. Okay, that's That's fine. That's fine. Right. 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 I guess we're a couple minutes late. Here you, here you, here you. We officially start. That's a good microphone. <laughs> Welcome to Babel. So what's our agenda to start with? We're going to start with, um, oh, I'm Russ White. I'm a routing geek. 
And I'm not the least like, I don't know. I'm a bureaucrat. No, I don't know. <laughs> They do this on purpose. They have one. Oh, one. so this this slide is wrong. Oh, it's um Martin now, right? All right. So I'm. We now have a new AD. Martin is Martin. Martin's here. Martin's here. Martin. I, everybody trusts this working group so much. And, uh, yeah. You can you can you can tell we're a very heavy, hard working working group that does all sorts of I was gonna comment at the at the at the routing area open meeting that they seem to have given you all the non controversial working groups. Was that intentional? Um, I don't know. I don't know if in the discussion on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh well that's right, spring. But I heard spring was closing. No. <laughs> Anyway, this is the new note well, which uh, you should note. It's got uh, pointers. And actually, the BCP appears twice here because it's sort of referencing parts of it, two different parts of it. So people should review documents. It's great. Uh, so this is a proposed agenda. Um, so there's three presentations. And uh, Dennis also wants to just have a couple minutes to talk about the revised uh, RC is working on. Bash, anybody have any changes? People have topics they want to add or delete? Yeah, right. so I'll, uh, so that's sort of related to security, maybe after, right after the DTLS, I don't know, whatever. Sometime we can slip a few minutes in for you if we keep on schedule. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how, uh, we're not behind schedule yet, so. And anyway, um, so just quickly review status. Uh, we've got uh, these. I guess there's a your. I don't have your draft on here. Uh, I just have sixty one twenty six bis, um, but I didn't update this recently. Anyway, there's uh, it was these are uh, working group adopted drafts. So the home net draft and the. I guess it doesn't have any personal drafts on here except for the. Ted Lemon home net draft. And of course, there's the original set of RFCs. So I guess there's a 7298 bis, right? Yeah. So that's also you know, maybe on a list, list of personal drafts next time. So we're kind of behind on our milestones. So not too much to say about that. Possibly we should revise the milestones to get them back in sync where we think the working group really is. But uh, we can do that offline and stuff. I don't have any proposal for changing the milestones currently or anything. Um, so if people are OK with the agenda, yeah, yeah. Uh, Julius Krabacek, what's happening with source specific? What I'm happened? I'm clear on what we should do about source specific now. As, uh, far, as, I'm con as far as I can tell, there is consensus. OK. Uh, there is consensus for the source specific draft, and I'm asking the group what I should do next. Um, what status is it in? I don't know. Is it? Did we do a working group last call on it? No. Okay. Well, I guess what you should do is ask for a working group last call. Can uh, I do it now? Uh, since, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. I, I'm. A, I'd like to ask for working group last call for source specific. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's been around for a while and it's been discussed, and uh, so it's I will. Right? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah there's our, there are implementations. So. Uh, so uh, it's a, of course, sort of based on. Sixty-one twenty-six bis, which is, sort of still in an extended working group last call, waiting to resolve the things that I believe. So. Uh, I will post. I'll start to do that right after the meeting here. Uh, any other interesting things people want to do? That are, or should we just proceed with the uh, update on the bird implementation status of Babel? Sounds good. Uh, actually, I'm seeing here. That is a very interesting microphone. Uh, so. So, 
Oh, this is what I have. You want me to to are there? Uh, so you say in my mail. Uh, which, That's fine. Okay. Is that? Oh, sure. That looks like a good one. Uh, inbox. This is a very small inbox. So, um, I'll be down here, I guess. We will. So, I assume this is pretty close to what is uh, online. Yes. So, I'll just go ahead and uh, use. Yes, and if you give me the little gizmo out of it, you may, might be able to advance the slides. Uh, okay. This is what you just sent me. Uh, uh, probably want to view the uh, full screen version. Yes. Can I get it on this screen as well? Uh, oh, I see. Well, I can see it. No, I'll, hold, on. <laughs> hold on a second. Let me. Uh, uh, so, what I want to do here, I think, is just go to the. Uh, 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 Command F1. Command F1. Uh, so actually, I just want to force them to be the same. Uh, there we go. There we go. So I now have only one display, so to speak. Uh, and it's higher resolution, looks like. Uh, there we go. All right. And I can maybe. Yes, I can do things. Amazing. All right, awesome. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Toki Harland Jorgensen, and I am the author of the uh, BIRD implementation of Babel. And I am going to give you a short update on the status of this implementation, since it's been a while since you've been forced to listen to me. Um, so a uh, quick recap for those who don't know what the, what the BIRD writing daemon is. So it's a from scratch implementation of a lot of major routing protocols. Um, it already spoke BGP, OSPF, RIP, BDF, and RA, some of which you might notice are not actually routing protocols, um, but they were there as well. And I added uh, Babel support to this a few years ago. It's a very nice implementation. It's a very nice daemon, clean code, um, well organized, readable, uh, and the daemon itself is pretty scalable. There's, like, it's, there's no problems using this for a full BGP routing table, for example. Um, so this seemed like a cool place to implement Babel. And of course, Bird is also developed by some friendly and very meticulous Czech people, which is really nice when you have them reviewing your code. And so um, I did the initial implementation in 2015 of Babel, uh, and I did an implementation experience talk of this at the uh, ITF 95 a few years ago. And at this, that point, uh, there was no release that contained the uh, Babel code, but that was first done in BERT 1.6 in April 2016. Uh, that was an implementation of the original RFC 6126 with no extensions, um, but because the 1.6 version of BERT is not dual stack, this was IPv6 only. It did interoperate with, um, with Babel D. So since then, um, with the release of BERT 2.0 in December that last year, we now finally have IPv4 support. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, just in time for the end of the 20th century, plus minus a few decades. Um, so this is not actually speaking Babel over v4, but this carries the uh, the v4 routes over the v6 packets, just as Babel D does, and it does that in a way that interoperates with the original um, Babel D implementation as well. And then there's been a few updates since then, as we've been working with uh, RFC 6126 bis. So we've added sub TLB parsing. Um, and we now honor the uh, mandatory bit as well and discard all mandatory sub TLVs that we don't know, which is basically all of them with one exception. We also 
it's also learned about hello flags, and we also will cheerfully now discard unicast hellos. And so this was um, the thing that I had to revise my slides because the nice people over at BERT headquarters, as you can see, uh, released a new version just a few hours ago. So uh, before this was on the list of non-released features, but that means that there's now a released version of um, the BERT routing daemon that speaks or specific routing um, from the updated draft. So that is the uh, implementation of Babel source specific 03, uh, which means that it will speak to the Git version of Babel D, but since the encoding has changed, does not interoperate with the um, legacy version. So unfortunately for people who already run source specific routing, a flag day is needed, um, but that was going to be the case anyway. And as you can see, it's source specific routing in itself is pretty easy to implement in the core protocol. It's less than 200 lines of code. I'm cheating a little bit here because, of course, that requires the kernel to know source specific routing, to know what to do with them. Uh, and this is, does not count the, um, the BERT core changes to, source, to support source specific routing either, which is another 200 lines of code or so. So all in all, it's not that much. And um, it's pretty useful to have source specific running, so that's nice. Then there's a few additional unreleased changes uh, which have not been up accepted upstream yet. One of them is the acknowledged retractions optional algorithm that was added in RFC 6126 bis, also known as the Chuan algorithm. Um, that is pending code review. It's actually about the same amount of code as source specific routing. Um, but uh, it's pretty neat because what it does is that uh, when a route goes away, instead of having to wait for the whole time, which should be several minutes, we can now remove the black hole almost immediately since we get retractions from, um, from other peers. And then I have been playing around with Unicast stuff. Um, but I got stuck somewhere around. So that is only on my laptop, and I will not show it to you. And then looking further ahead, um, obviously, I've plans to experiment some more with the Unicast stuff. We are, I also have some plans to do the security, depending on the next talk and what we end up deciding there. Um, tentatively, there's HMAC support already in BERT. So, um, I was probably going to start with that, but we'll see where we end up in the discussion. And then there's also the whole Wi-Fi issue with, um, it would be really neat to be able to get some parameters out of the kernel and do something useful with that, instead of just doing the multicast hack where we look for drop packets. And of course, scaling packet transmissions, I think it would be really fun to try to dump a full BGP routing table into Babel and see what happens. And um, those sorts of things. And of course, this is not a promise to implement features or do any work or anything whatsoever. Uh, this is just ideas at this point. And if anyone else wants to implement some of it, please do. Um, that would be cool. So just to sum up, uh, we have a full RFC 6126 bis implementation in BERT 2.0. It's interoperable with the deployed BattleD, except for the source specific. Oh, bugger, I forgot to update this. Uh, this should say 2.0.2 .2 and not git. Sorry about that. <laughs> Which does not interoperate with Babel D, but uh, it does interoperate with the upcoming Babel D, which Julius will release any time now. Um, and security and unicast work is pending. <laughs> so please test, report back, patches also welcome, and so on and so forth. OK, one question, Russ White LinkedIn. No chair hat on. Um, this is kind of a technical question, maybe. So you're carrying V4 routes over the V6 transport. Are you? How does the bird? Does, the, how does bird bird interact with the rib in terms of next hops for V4? Just curious. Uh, that's the next hop TLV. Okay, but I'm asking, like, does it check to make sure the V4 next hop exists before it tries to install, or does it try to install and then it just fails if there's no V4 next hop, or how does, does was that something that you had to deal with? If so, I'm curious good, how you did. That's a good question. Um, okay. I, I don't recall offhand. Uh, I don't right. think it's doing something terribly um, intelligent about that. I'll check. Okay. 
Cool. Thanks. Yes. Tony P. Juniper. Uh, so first question is, uh, has anything has been done on the Linux kernel for the source destination-specific lookup? What do you mean been done with? Uh, I mean, like you said, Babel is fantastic for the stuff. You get all the source destination stuff, but now you need the lookup support in the kernel, right, to push uh, it in. Yes. That has so been did they the do any work, serious work in this respect? That has been supported in the Linux kernel for several years. Uh, for v6. Oh, OK, excellent. Yes. For v6. OK, yes. excellent. So I, I just left yeah. this information. So uh, for v4, you can implement it using policy routing, but that is not implemented. But there's native support for it in the Linux kernel since at least version 4. OK, so I go look at it. And then obviously, since you run uh, out of ideas for 200 lines patches, you shall implement beer, right? And we actually <laughs> And we actually have the you know, completely native v6 encoding on the plate. So you can run the whole beer in um, user space without any kernel support, right? So it's like hop, mm -hmm. hop by hop, link local to link local, and you get the full frame, and you can do whatever you want. And then push right. it further out. Yes, I will, okay. uh, I will put that on my list of ideas. Um, 200 I lines, quite maybe 210. Maybe you add it or may crash. So. <laughs> uh, David, skip. Uh, yes, David, please, please send a patch for beer support. Uh, I would be happy to look at it. Um, channeling Marcus Stenberg, who said that uh, source-specific routing has been in Linux uh, for four years, and 90% of it. There are some slight bugs on side edge cases, but in general, it's been there for four years. Yes. <coughs> All right. All right. OK, Julius Krabacek, just that means that you have that means that you have, as far as I can tell, you're fully compliant with 6.126 bis as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. And you can implement the Babel profile for HomeNet. Probably. As, uh, except perhaps for link quality estimation. Do you do it? Yes, you do. Um, On Wi-Fi. What do you mean link quality? You do ETX. Yes. OK. Right. Okay. Okay. It's working. Yeah, I you, think. <laughs> you want to control? We can move this, change this, move the slides for back with that. Well, hello, I'm Antonin Destimo, and I'm going to present a joint work with Julius Krobocek about securing Babel with DTLS. So we need uh, security in Babel, and for that we have two approaches. Either we could secure the lower layer uh, with protocols such as WPA, OpenVPN, or uh, we could secure Babel in Babel, or Babel in Babel. Um, with uh, two approaches uh, also, so Babel HMAC cryptographic authentication or DTLS. Uh, DTLS is the transport layer uh, security uh, adapted to work on UDP on datagrams. And this is a subject of this talk. Uh, why DTLS? So DTLS is a plus because uh, we don't have to think about how a new uh, a new security protocol and we don't have to implement it. It's someone else's problem. DTLS provides asymmetric keys and uh, authentication and confidentiality. Okay, so good things. We have a working implementation. <laughs> we use the embed TLS uh, at, uh, for uh, our TLS implementations. So uh, here you can see a screen capture, a uh, uh, packet capture, I mean. Uh, we have uh, neighbor discovery packets in blue then a DTLS handshake starting, and after the completion of the handshake, the two Babel peers exchange uh, Babel protected data in green. Uh, this is, uh, for the moment, the, the user interface. So we, you have to say that you want to use Unicast on uh, the interface. Then you want to enable uh, DTLS on the interface, and you just give to Babel a link to uh, your certificate, the private key, and uh, eventually, the, uh, optionally, the the, uh, the CA uh, certificate and the key, the password to the private key. Okay, so Babel is based on UDP. You can use Babel over unicast and multicast, and Babel is a peer 
pure peer-to-peer -peer protocol. It means, oops, oops. It means that the same port is used for source and for destination. And Babel D, the implementation, uh, the reference implementation of Babel, uses a lot of multicast, but DTLS can only protect unicast. So Julius had to rewrite the buffering mechanism in Babel D uh, from uh, a lot of multicast to uh, unicast. Uh, the implementation in the implementation, unicast is independent from DTLS, and now we can protect Babel. So it means that the, the routing information is protected, but uh, neighbor discovery packets, so um, hellos and link quality estimation packets, so hellos and I heard use, remain unprotected. Okay, now I'm going to talk about our current prototype. So uh, in DTLS, the handshake is asymmetric, but Babel is purely symmetric, and you have to break that symmetry. So we use the classic technique of uh, selecting the lowest link layer address, uh, the peer with the lower link layer address, and it becomes the DTLS server, handshake server. Uh, now, when we uh, receive a packet, so the bubble uh, structure is pure peer-to-peer. -peer. We would like to preserve this with DTLS. So we choose to receive all traffic from Babel and from DTLS on the same socket. But we have now to differentiate packets coming from DTLS and coming from Babel. And it turns out that the DTLS library can do that for us most of the time. Uh, so we have to, uh, so we receive the uh, packets from on the same socket and uh, we try to decrypt the packets. So we give the packet to the, to the TLS library. And uh, if we succeed uh, to decrypt the packet, we tag it, we tag the packet as secure. And if we fail, we tag the packet as insecure. If the packet is insecure, we will ignore all TLVs except hellos and IHU. Uh, so we either other way, we pass the packet. As an optimization, multicast is insecure by default because DTLS cannot protect multicast. And this behavior in, is interleaved with the DTLS handshake, meaning that uh, while we are processing a DTLS handshake, we can still receive raw double packets. When we emit a packet, we say that all unicast packets are protected. And so we never sent a unicast packet that isn't protected by DTLS. And all multicast packets are sent in the clear, but we never send, we only sent uh, a low and I heard you TLVs uh, by multicast. Of course, there are other approaches. We could uh, use a pure peer to peer on another port. So we would have one port for Babel and one port for DTLS traffic. We could use a classic client server model or embed DTLS into a sub, uh, embed DTLS data into a sub TLV. So clearly, this is not a serious proposal. David is, is, is laughing, Julius, they are laughing, okay. But we have two bits of disagreement. Should the server port be the same as the Babel port? And should the client port be the same as the server port? We need to discuss that. And uh, we still have some open questions. That, uh, so is passing insecure packets really a good idea? And uh, another question was raised on the list. What if a peer reboots after a successful DTLS handshake? Uh, so it turns out that there is a section in the DTLS RFC uh, telling us what we should do, but uh, most implementations uh, don't do this. Uh, we could uh, use different ports, or we could do a bit of hacking in the client or in DTLS library. There is room for other internships here. Uh, also, on the usability of Bible D, how should we deploy keys and certificates and roll the invalidated keys or whatever? And another question, will the DTLS overhead cost fragmentation, especially when exchanging uh, certificates and, and keys? So good news, Babel can be protected by DTLS. We have a running implementations that protects data, but not discovery. And hopefully it will be available soon in Babel D. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so Tony P again, uh, from long experience with IGPs. Uh, so key management, still it's straight out from the IGP protocols. Um, and yes, it's manual, it's a rollover. They went through all this operational stuff. I mean, it's it well understood what ultimately customer deploys, right? Um, the most common attack is really replace. Mm -hmm. I do not protect against that at all. Um, 
because DTLS doesn't give you any nonces or anything like that, I assume, right? So it does. So DTLS does already the reply protection. So what's the reason about this adjacency formation? It's just because multicast and that you don't know how to encrypt multicast. I mean, you can put something and encrypt that stuff, even a small piece of information on this key, and it will give you, you know, at least you know that it's the right guy sending. Because the most common attack was really like replay protection, especially okay. on the adjacency, uh, which most often ended up just being a denial of service, right? Because they weren't able to like get the adjacency yeah. fully up, but you can actually mock things up pretty badly okay. with simple replay attacks. Okay. So just practical <coughs> experience. Uh, David Skenazi, Apple. To uh, answer to Tony, the uh, yeah, so. DTLS gives us um, replay protections amongst a bunch of other properties. But indeed, if we don't do anything to protect the hellos, the attack on Babel is, well, so you can send evil hellos and mess up the sequence number counts, which will completely mess up your link estimation. And you could also replay them, which would probably have the same effect, actually. Um, but that's, um, yeah, that's it about DTLS. So I have another Hello, my name is Dennis, and I've been waiting for this for about two years, the DTLS uh, mechanism, because uh, Yelush had advertised it since 2016, and I've been asking um, the same question. Is it possible to see a document that explains how things are expected to work? Uh, for instance, um, security considerations, the things, the bad things that you see might be happening and how you see the mechanism is protecting the maintenance of the routing protocol from those bad things you see. Um, and I didn't have the opportunity to see a document that would explain it. It's a nice work, work in progress, okay? I'm not saying you're doing a bad thing or... Um, what I'm saying, there should be a document that explains what you meant to achieve such that if what you're doing is not what you wanted to do, other people can see it and say, that's what you're going to do, that's what you have actually done. So if this can be fixed, then we need to fix it. Otherwise, um, we should review the assessment of the security threat and say that, no, that's not the model that should be, okay. should be different, then the implementation should be different. So in a normal development process, things go forth and back, such mm -hmm. that you build, then you look what you have, then you get back to the specification, proofread once again, and you need to have a document okay. so that you have a thing to discuss and okay. to say that this is what you have missed, this is what's done right. And in that document, it would be nice to have a section that spells exactly how many bytes do you introduce as an overhead to yep. main protocol. Because okay. there should be some overhead. It would be mm -hmm. nice to know how much it's like five percent, fifty percent of the normal traffic. I think we have to do some testing uh, well, yep. It's one of the things that needs to be discussed because when okay. you hit yes. an, a specific implementation that can do only those many bytes on the wire because that's the, the type of link that you have, then you need to see if the protocol can still work on that link. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I, I was wanted, this is Donald Eastlake with Huawei. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, such a document seems like a great thing to have. Um, and it just uh, mentioning on, on unicast and multicast, I mean, the DTLS has, uh, I think, where it does this handshake to generate the keys, so it's mm -hmm. sort of inherently... Uh, peer-to-peer uh, -peer kind of thing, uh, you know, point, point to point, um, and you know, sort of the natural. You could easily build something which is multicast, but has some kind of group key. Okay. But but uh, it's easier and to do that securely if you want to have a group key of something like that. If you have some way to distribute that key to the group members, you know, it so you kind of want to have a point-to-point -point security already set up, but the funny thing where, where you most need the multicast is where you're first discovering people and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of problem. Um, 
So anyway, I just wanted to say that. Thank okay. you. Uh, Julius Krobacek said, so first like to answer Dennis's objection. Uh, there was no intention to exclude anyone, anyone by not writing things down. So actually the two implementations happened last week. Okay, so Antonin finished uh, two weeks ago. Uh, right when the, the packet passed. It was a Sunday, I remember. Yes, yes. But I don't remember whether it was last Sunday or the Sunday before that. Two weeks before. <laughs> as to, as to um, David, he finished 10 days ago, I believe. So I will just, so first I would like to point out that, you know, there is on one side Antonin and on the other side a multi-billion corporation and Antonin <laughs> finished first. <laughs> yes. And the other point is that we, it is really very, very recent stuff and we simply haven't written anything down yet. Okay. Wow. Hmm? And uh, so the second point is uh, that I'd like to make is about the first slide, if you can show it back. Oh, second slide. So what we now have are two extensions to Babel for cryptographic security, and they are very different. So HMAC is simple, uh, makes no other requirements, and has minimal and does symmetric keying only with a shared key for everyone, only does authentication, no encryption, no privacy, and protects everything, including multicast, and requires very little changes to your Babel implementation. You're still doing Babel over multicast. Babel over DTLS is this work, and this thing makes you depend on a complex library that you don't understand, because nobody understands DTLS, and, but on the other hand, it means that crypto is somebody else's problem. So at some point, we're going to have to decide which we want to have as strongly recommended in the draft. And I would be in favor of pushing Babel HMAC with Babel over DTLS being the optional algorithm that is reserved for those environments in which you really don't want to have your own security stack or you need the extra features. You're saying that uh, DTLS moves all the security someplace else, but it's not clear to me that it seems to me you need to protect to provide some protection against uh, uh, people screwing with hellos and I heard you and stuff like that. And if DTLS doesn't do that, then it's, even though it may push the crypto off to somebody else, it may not, the crypto provided by this other party may not be what you need. So. <laughs> right. So there was one proposal for that. So my impression was that we're not protecting against the OS. Yeah. Okay. It looks well. like I was wrong. If we want to be protecting against the OS, then DTLS can work, I believe, thanks to the Unicast Hello extension ah, okay. that was recently done. But I think David has clearer ideas than I do on that subject. Is that? Sure. Well, you, OK. Uh, uh, Tony P again. So I would, uh, from practical standpoint, having played with this stuff for 20 years, right? Uh, I would second what uh, Yulius says. Uh, replay protection plus something like SHA-1 for integrity is mostly as far as people go. And if you have something which is simple, that's in preconditional library, lots of overhead, you know, computational overhead, this goes a long way. Where the world is going, uh, the DTLS will give you a leg up, right? I mean, uh, the security guys are coming down heavy. They're coming down heavy for a good reason, right? So I think you'll end up there anyway. But having DTLS as the only option, uh, that's a fairly fat pick, yeah. You know, if you want, like, practically deploy the protocol and be successful with it. Um, one thing I'd like to add, David Skenazi, Apple. Um, DTLS doesn't just uh, give you uh, encryption on top of this. Uh, it does a new key exchange every time you set up a new uh, association. And so that means that you will never have replay attacks or messages that could come on a later date or people sending traffic they slightly modified. It has a much uh, cleaner security boundary. And if you say that everything like hellos are outside or hellos are and i heard you are outside and everything else is inside you know that everything else is completely immune from um 
uh, replay attacks. Whereas with the HVAC work, Dennis found a very clever attack on it, which because of the way it is, it's kind of harder to reason about and harder to make a security boundary. So it might have other attacks. I'm not a security expert, but it might have other problems as well. We could also, another option is to use a combination of both where you could um, establish DTLS, use a key exporter, and use that to HMAC the uh, hellos. And that gives you a very secure model that is also immune from DOS attacks. That's an option. Okay. I think I'm going to cut the line after you. You go ahead. Uh, yeah. Are you getting any line again? Uh, yes. OK. Toby Holland Jagenson. Um, so uh, I like features as much as the next person, but I think from my point of view, having something like basically what Tony's at, having something that's really simple and doesn't give you uh, all the security features, but does the does give you um, a barrier between, for me, the sort of the, the main thing that this security mechanism should provide is I run a network, I control the routers, I run Babel, on the same links that there might be client machines, and the client machines that do not know the password cannot mess with the routing. Like that's sort of the symbol use case. But it, we don't really have a an agreement on what features we want. Like there's no threat model. That's I think so. It's sort of a a difficult discussion. But to me, at least, having the option of doing the simple thing would be. Um, important and also from an implementation point of view I would also like to have security available in environments where I can't have a DTLS library uh, such as on a tiny eeny bitty Linux router with two megabytes of flash. So more input on that. Um, so there is really this layering of you know what security co is comprised of right so the SHA is like the simple integrity if you want, then you have to replay thing, and then you have really the, uh, what you call it, uh, what you can see what's inside. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's, it has a name. Yeah, confidentiality, right? And um, you'll be shocked why people deployed OSPF HMAC. The one single most important reason was they didn't want, by misconfiguration, having random adjacency coming up. There was a protection against people misconfiguring the network. It had nothing to do with security. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Well. So the keys are hanging there for 20 years. And the only reason is like, you know, you can't just randomly bring up adjacencies. Um, and then, you know, the Because it's a really good error correction yeah, mechanism. Yeah, no, it's just, it's error correction and harder to, com to, to misconfigure. Right. And then yeah. the reply attacks were there, uh, getting more common. And the, confident the confidentiality, is something that has always overhead in the price. You have funky libraries, you know, funky version of the libraries. You have to run funky tunnels. You need, if you bring up IPsec tunnel, before you get this, you know, the, the, the security association, it takes forever and then some, so the convergence slows down. And practically speaking, people don't do that, right? And then you think like, oh yeah, but then you, they really have a, a key infrastructure. No one ever deployed a dynamic key infrastructure on the routing protocol. And I built some, I have been paid for it. But then once people understood what is the implication that you literally break your network, right? If you lose the, 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 the key authority, no one dared to flip the door, no matter how paranoid they were. And I dealt with some pretty paranoid people, including you know, like the people who shoot missiles yeah. in the sky. Yeah. So I'll say the other thing, with my chair hat off, I would get up and walk around, but Tony was blocking the microphone. <laughs> is, you were very good size. Anyway, is that, um, is that, that's your job, is that when I was at Cisco and we were testing um, HMAC MD5 uh, and we decided to test performance, we, d we determined that turning on encryption on routing protocols is actually an awesome way to open up a new security hole in your network because most modern processors even if you throw enough missigned garbage at them it will take down the processor on the router so you've opened yourself to a denial of service attack at very low packet rates much lower than you might expect 
I, I think we really kind of have to move on to the next item. But. Um, okay, I just wanted to make a quick point about the point of disagreement on the ports. Uh, would you, could I make a quick 30-second Okay, point? that's a different topic. Go ahead, ports. Want to say something about the ports? Yes. Go ahead. So, thank you. Uh, as um, Otanam pointed out, there are several ways we can do this. Um, I just wanted to insist on the fact that I feel very strongly that we should have a separate port and randomized client ports. Okay. It, in um, general, it is possible to get two port assignments for a protocol, one for sort of insecure and one for secure. That's one thing that the port, I've, I guess it's the pool of experts that are for port assignments will will allow two in that case. So it should, if we want to do that, we should be able to do it. So yeah. I, we need more discussion on the list perhaps, but. Yep. No, I just really yeah. wanted to point out that most implementations, we would be, if we use the same port, we'd be relying on something that as far as I know, and I've asked a bunch of people in the TLS working group, no implementation exists that supports this. And having to go and change DTLS implementations is not something I'm comfortable doing. Okay, so we, we got to move, because Dennis wanted to talk briefly about uh, 7298BIS, and we do have another talk. So what, what do you want to say, Drew? I just have a very quick, that I believe that everything that David is speaking about can be done in the client, but that's a debate for another day. Okay. I do have, okay. Anyway, thank you for your... Thank you. Okay, so that, you want to speak about, about 7298BIS? Uh, yeah. I mean, so you asked for a few minutes to, to do that, so uh, go ahead. Hello, mm, I'm Dennis, and I'm here mostly to remind about my message in the working group mailing list. I have a project, an individual internet draft that I believe addresses the problem that I had described a few times uh, on the mailing list, and on ITF 98, I think, um, session. I had slides that mm, explained in, in as, as much detail as possible how the attack works, and we had a few threads. Now, I have updated uh, the 7298 with a solution that I believe solves the problem, and because it's still an individual idea, I would like to propose it as a working group document because as an individual ID it's useless and it doesn't serve the purpose. If the working group is interested to pick it up, I can finish the document. At the moment it contains the essential parts, the technical description. Then it needs some generic changes. I can do them if it becomes a working group document. If it doesn't become then, well, I've got a lot of other things to do. So I'm mainly, mainly drawing your attention to what I believe to be an adoption call, right? What's the yeah. term for it? Uh, if there's anybody who objects to issuing a call for working group adoption, they should speak up. Otherwise, we'll do a call and you know see what people say. And the, unless there's objections, we'll probably adopt it. Yeah. I had explained um, the attack in detail before. Um, if Anybody wants to discuss, I can discuss. I can explain how the solution works. But if you want to talk about, I would expect people, I would reasonably expect people to read what I have written, maybe together with me. We can run through the document and then you can have your opinion if it actually solves the problem or if it doesn't. But I think it does. Regarding the point that we discussed five minutes ago uh, about control plane protection with the computation, computa computational intensive operations hitting the central processor on the device, right? In 7298 original, there are provisions that address that specific problem. They try to keep CPU load as low as possible when the attack just feeds packets uh, that pretend to be pretend to be integrity protected. That's it. So that there is a, a mitigation already in that document for that for that problem. That's it. Okay, thank you. I think uh, so we'll issue a call on the work on the mailing list for 
working group adoption of the 7298 BIS draft. Uh, next is uh, Babel information model. Alrighty, so it's been a while since we actually discussed this, and I know y'all are all really excited about it. Um, but anyway, this is just a brief structural overview of what's in the current draft. Um, but Julius and I met on Monday, and then I internalized our meeting on Tuesday, and then we talked again on Tuesday. And so there's a lot that's going to be changing, but it's still mostly this. It's just not quite, but anyway, that's what it was. Um, now, one thing that we are going to get into, um, you know, I, I just put this slide just to uh, compile a list so people have a warm, fuzzy feeling that they know what actually would be configurable from the data model as opposed to um, just readable. And it's just that it may be configurable because it is up to the implementation to decide whether or not to expose something as configurable or even to make it configurable to some people, but not others. Um, there are changes coming in the O2 version. Yeah, there's a lot of nits that are fixing. I'm adding an appendix that's going to have the change log, so you can see what all the changes are, but just some kind of big things. Yeah, that's not really big. Um, yeah, we are adding a Babel link type, taking away this lossy link, and so we'll be able to expand the, it, as, it as an enumeration as other link types become supported in implementations, um, for example, Powerline Coax. Um, we still need to work some on the Babel security object, but in any case, I'm allowing for credentials, uh, multiple credentials of one's own in addition to um, multiple credentials of uh, NCA credentials and things like that, um, just in the description. But, you know, how a, a, uh, how a security mechanism makes use of these credential lists is up to that security technology. Um, we're going to add some route filtering rules, uh, a table for that. That'll be optional to support a security log um, just to record any time um, when you actually examine credentials. Uh, and yeah, there's some other things. We're going to get rid of the source table. Um, anyway, that's just a summary. I hope this is readable and I didn't make it too small. I'm really sorry, but there's some open issues. Um, I'm not going to step through them all. Y'all can read through them and tell me if there's any that stand out at you, but I'd be curious. Um, I think one of the, let's see, at the end. Oh yeah, this was number eight. This was all based on input from Julius, so it reflects his implementation. We really need input from other implementers. Okay, and, and just so you understand, it is structured that a lot of the um, data model parameters are listed as optional, and that is because if an implementation does not support these, if it's not something that in how that implementation is designed, that's perfectly okay. You don't have to support or implement the parameters either, even if you choose to implement the information model via some data model. Um, so that's kind of what optional means. It means, well, optional. Amazing. Huh? Amazing. I know, right? <laughs> it does not mean should. That's a totally different word. OK. Any, nothing? Nothing? OK. 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 Well, wow. okay, then I'll say something. <laughs> Julius Krobacek. Um, so one thing that users do want to configure is filtering rules. And the three implementations, the three main implementations, the three, sorry, um, open source implementations of Babel have very different configuration languages for filtering. And uh, I don't think it is our job here to extract a common filtering language from free range routing, uh, bird, and my uh, homebrew implementation. Okay, and I don't know what to do about that. And I would say to leave the um, filtering rules as an APAC object. So I'll say, um, Russ, LinkedIn, chair hat off. 
that it is not your job to bother with trying to mess with the filtering rules. It's whatever is in the implementation that you're using, bird, free range routing, whatever, because the users of those implementations are going to expect them to be the way they are for BGP, OSPF, ISIS, whatever. So we had discussed that I would just um, put a proposal in and see, you know, if people like it, we can have it as to how to model really basic filtering. And if something does more advanced filtering than really, really basic stuff, then it's just not in the model and it's not configurable via that model and they would have to do custom model elements. But Or we could do nothing about filtering either way. I mean, but I can propose it and you can see it and throw up all over it and then we take it out. I'm afraid. I'm very afraid that if we start doing filtering rules, then we will end up adding features and never finishing. Uh, I guess I have a question. Would it make any sense to have sort of an opaque block of stuff, which only uh, something that understood that implementation could uh, parse, but could be obtainable through the uh, whatever method you had of reading out the uh, configuration, you know, with your management protocol. Say that again. Just have uh, an opaque blob of filtering rule stuff that, you know, you could obtain through your whatever uh, management protocol you were using, but you'd only be able to understand if you understood that implementation. Honestly, it makes more sense to suggest that an implementation create custom um, parameters for their implementation if they want to expose it. And they extend the model? Yes. Okay, that, that's probably true. I, I, you know, this was out, that was completely off the top of my head. And, uh, okay. So does anybody have anything else for this meeting, I guess? Uh, got anything you want to say? Yeah. Uh, I guess not. So uh, I'll see people on the mailing list. And, and, and Oh, wait a sec, sorry. Uh, I'm too fast here. Go ahead. Hi, Roland Valtino. Um, not to throw a spanner in the works, but it's, I read the source-specific uh, extension a while back. And it's a very short document, especially if you leave off all the boilerplate. And on each page of the remaining uh, document were about three or four references to the 6126 document. I was wondering, would it not be simpler to just merge the two things? Mm. <laughs> well, um, that's so, yeah. Just a suge suggestion for your consideration. Sure. Well, no, it's really for the working group's consideration. I mean, you know, we can we can merge documents or split documents. I don't know. I mean, the um, David Skenazi, Apple. I would prefer them to stay separate, precisely because it's an optional feature, and in that case, I would kind of say. You implement one RFC gives you the main in Babel, and then every extension to Babel is its own RFC. That seems natural to me. And also, the timelines might not align exactly in terms of when we want to publish both documents. Toby Harland Jarenson. Yeah, same point, but I would add that um, you don't always have a forwarding plane that can handle source specific routing. So if we added it to the main document, we would have to make it optional and i think that could add as much text now than the back references from the extension does and i think that having doc the documents be really short is a feature it's uh <laughs> it's one of one of my main um my favorite things about this working group is the short length of the documents The thing is the readability of the extension uh, uh, draft uh, or RFC as it's going to be. Um, if you have to go back and forth to the, to the main document all the time, 
that was my reason for suggesting it. Okay, anybody have any other topics or points they want to bring up? Or, uh, we have one minute left, maybe. <laughs> I, I guess not. Anyway, um, I guess we are adjourned in that case. Thank you all for playing. See you on the list. Yeah. <clears throat>